for the next six weeks, we have the opportunity to go to Wosha, which is Wolfba, Wosha. It's a little football place, but they play in soccer up there. They're going to let us come up, sit up, and pass out coffee and hot chocolate from 9 to 12 for the next six weeks. They got 600 kids signed up to play soccer. That means close to 1,000 people will roll through there every Saturday morning. So it's an opportunity to put a flyer, a hot cup of coffee, and a smile on somebody. So if you can help with that, come during that time, talk to Nicole. Wonderful ministry opportunity. Anything else? Yeah, the sign-up sheets are side by side. Brother Whaley. All right, y'all take your hymnal. Oh, y'all got somebody else say something else? Say it again. Outreach tomorrow night at 6 o'clock. All right, your hymnal is there in front of you, underneath the seat if you're on the first row. So you take it, and we're going to open it up, and we're going to sing. The words will not be on the screen. So when y'all see Miss Jessica, thank her for all she does, because she, she has to work on Sunday night, so she's not able to... And so that's why your words aren't up there. So it makes you more appreciative, doesn't it? <laughs> 217, 217. Oh, how I love Jesus because he first loved me. There is a name I love to hear. I love to sing its word. It sounds like music in my ear. The sweetest name on earth. Oh, how I love Jesus. Oh, how I love Jesus. Oh, how I love Jesus because he first loved me. It tells me of a Savior's love who died to set me free. Me of his precious blood the sinner's perfect plea. Oh, how I love Jesus. Oh, how I love Jesus. Oh, how I love Jesus because he first loved me. It tells me of my Father has in store for every day. And though I tread a darksome path, yield sunshine all the way. Oh, how I love Jesus. Oh, how I love Jesus. Oh, how I love Jesus because he first loved me. It tells me one who's loving can feel my deepest woe, who in each sorrow bears a part that none can bear below. Oh, how I love Jesus. Oh, how I love Jesus. Oh, how I love Jesus because he first loved me. 425. 425. There's within my heart a melody. Jesus whispers sweet and low. Fear not, I am with thee, peace be still, in of all thy bells and flow. Jesus, 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 sweetest name I know, fills my every longing, keeps me singing as on the second all my life was wrenched by sin and strife. Discord filled my heart with pain. Jesus swept across the broken strings, 
Start the stumbling cords again. Jesus, 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 sweetest name I know. Fills my every longing, keeps me singing on the last. Soon he's coming back to welcome me. Far beyond the starry skies, I shall wing my flight to worlds unknown. I shall reign with him on high. Jesus, 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 sweetest name I know, fills my every longing, keeps me singing. Ushers, y'all make your way down. We're going to sing the chorus again. Jesus, 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 sweetest name I know, fills my every longing, keeps me singing as I go. We have any prayer needs? Someone who wants to come and uh, be prayed over, like we did this morning with Brother Butch. Anyone requesting special prayer tonight? She's not here. <laughs> Amen. You give us her first name. Cheyenne. Cheyenne. Okay. Is anybody here who wants to come up and be prayed over? Anyone? Okay. Okay. All right. Uh, let's just spend a minute in prayer then. Why don't we at this time? And I, we're not do a big prayer time tonight because we're concluding our Bible study here on uh, Laodicea, the church at Laodicea tonight. And uh, want to continue on with this study. And so we won't have a... If no one's coming up, we won't have a big prayer time tonight, okay? Let's pray. Father, as we read scriptures tonight, we do acknowledge, God, that it is your voice that we need to hear. We acknowledge, Lord, that it is the sustenance of the Word of God that we feed on. It is like manna from heaven. It gives us nourishment. It gives us wisdom. And Father, it gives us confidence when you speak into our lives. So today, Lord, we'd ask, God, for this one Cheyenne who's been mentioned, God, for a renewal, a repentance in her life, God, that she might be drawn back to you. 
And God, I'm sure there are many others here tonight who had some particular prayer need. And God, you know those needs before we'd ask. But God, we just intercede on their behalf tonight. And God, I ask you to truly use this place as a station of renewal and restoration. God, may this campus not be for us, but may it be for you to touch people as only you can. God, we want to be your servants. We want to be your hands and feet. Therefore, we have to have your heart. We have to love like you've loved. We have to forgive the way you forgive. So, Lord, tonight, we ask you to use us in your eternal plan. God, may the the people truly find acceptance, love, God, and, uh, and just a partnership as we go through this journey. Teach us, Lord, tonight from the church at Laodicea, God, that we may grow from their mistakes, that we may learn how to handle things better. So, Lord, I thank you for what you're going to do. Teach us now, Lord, is my prayer. In Jesus' name. Amen and amen. In the book of Revelation, we are told of seven letters Jesus wrote to churches in what it was then Asia Minor, an area now known as the country of Turkey. The last of these letters was addressed to the city of Laodicea. This city was located 43 miles southeast of Philadelphia and about 100 miles from Ephesus. It was strategically located where three highways converged, bringing the city great commercial prosperity. In fact, by Roman times, Laodicea had become the wealthiest city in the area. Sheep grazed on its fertile ground in the valley, and the glossy black wool of its prize animals was in demand throughout the Roman world. The agricultural prosperity generated banking interests, and when the city was destroyed by an earthquake in AD 60, no funds from Rome were necessary to rebuild. This great city had no need for economic stimulus that the Roman government offered. It is little wonder that this proud city boasted that it was rich and had need of nothing. In addition to its textiles and banking, Laodicea was also known for its medical school, which manufactured an ointment to heal ears and an eye salve, which was coveted for its healing properties. The doctors in the city became so famous that two of them had their names on the city's coins. But while the city seemed to have everything it needed, it had one serious weakness. It had no pure water of its own. Its water had to be supplied by an aqueduct from springs located six miles to its south. This left the city vulnerable for attack. It also posed another inconvenience. By the time the water got to the city, it was neither hot nor refreshingly cool. It was lukewarm. Religiously, Laodicea had a large number of residents who gave worship to the emperor. And so many Jews had come to live in this part of Asia that even the Jews of Jerusalem were moved to complain about the number of Jews who had forsaken Palestine for the luxuries and baths of Laodicea. The church in this city was probably established during Paul's third missionary journey while he ministered at Ephesus. Epaphras, the founder of the church at Colossae, probably made the brief journey to Laodicea and brought the gospel to this city as well. It was to the church located in this wealthy, self-sufficient city that Jesus wrote this final letter. To the angel of the church in Laodicea write, These are the words of the Amen the faithful and true witness, the ruler of God's creation. I know your deeds, that you are neither cold nor hot. I wish you were either one or the other. 
So because you are lukewarm, neither hot nor cold, I am about to spit you out of my mouth. You say, I am rich, I have acquired wealth and do not need a thing. But you do not realize that you are wretched, pitiful, poor, blind, and naked. I counsel you to buy from me gold refined in the fire so you can become rich and white clothes to wear so you can cover your shameful nakedness and salve to put on your eyes so you can see. Those whom I love I rebuke and discipline so be earnest and repent. Here I am. I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in and eat with him, and he with me. To him who overcomes, I will give the right to sit with me on my throne, just as I overcame and sat down with my father on his throne. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. I don't know about you, but I've enjoyed those videos each week, and they've given insight into uh, the ruins, the areas around where these churches were located. And, uh, but I don't want to talk a whole lot about what the city was like, other than to learn why Jesus talked about you need eye salve, because there were doctors there who made a salve. Jesus used the culture and things that were going on in the culture uh, to make a point sometime, to teach his Exam, to use as examples of things that he thought was important uh, and as teaching moments, uh, much like we can do today. I mean, I'm also impressed with how Paul had a big part in starting most of these churches. Uh, and that's really what the New Testament church is about. It's about spreading the gospel. That's what Paul was about. He was about spreading the gospel. And we are about that here. When I leave and go to Ukraine in a few weeks, it'll be about spreading the gospel, planning a new church, finding a group of believers that can help begin a new work. Uh, we do want you to be praying about uh, that and that whole, the safety of that trip and the significance of it. I, I failed this week. I did not bring a worksheet. I don't know how Miss Susie did that. It surely wasn't me. Anything that I don't get right, it's Miss Susie's fault. Y'all got to understand that. But uh, I, I had all this done by Wednesday, Thursday, and I just forgot to make a worksheet and get it printed out. So I brought blank tablets. If you would like to tear a few pages out, and I've got it all on the PowerPoint, but I, if you would like some paper, anybody need some paper to write down if you want to, just if you want to, I'm not going to get on to anybody like this morning if you didn't fill in the blanks. Right here. So if you want to tear a sheet out or two out. Anybody? <clears throat> I'd like my tablets back. Don't be stealing them. All right. Laodicea. A church that had a lot that we could learn from. A lot to teach. I'm sorry? Can we turn the lights back up a little bit? So some of them can see better. My wife can barely see with the lights up, much less with them down. <clears throat> Many people believe Laodicea is a type of uh, a picture of the modern day church. As I told you in the beginning of this study, the seven different churches could be correlated with seven periods of the church. How the church was changing in periods of time. Certain churches had certain characteristics that were pretty obvious and evident in the Christian church. This last one would be a church that if we were defining it, it would probably be uh, the lukewarm church. A church that had a lot of news, that had a lot of good things going on, a lot of wealth and a lot of prosperity, but not very successful, I think it would be fair to say. Not making the difference it should have made. 
Would you agree with me today that the church is pretty prosperous? Many of these churches started, if you've been to Africa and done missions in Africa as I have, you've, you've, been, you've been in churches that may have as many people as we have here tonight. And it's built out of poles that they've drug for a long distance. And it's kind of like, no, I started to say it's kind of like the barn, my barn that I keep hays in, but my barn's a lot nicer. And that's where they meet. And that's where they celebrate. And that's where they rejoice. And that's where they preach. And that's where they sing. Not everybody knows the prosperity that we know today. The freedoms, the powers that we, the church has today. And so, uh, this church is believed again by many to be a picture of the church today. Look as we go through it tonight and see if you would recognize some characteristics maybe of us. And I don't mean Washita, I mean the church of Jesus Christ. And, um, and, and let's, let's learn from it. We'll start in verse 14 tonight. The angel of the church of Laodicea write, These things says the Amen, the faithful and true witness, the beginning of the creation of God. That's the first thing in your outline tonight is the audience of this letter. The audience of this letter, uh, who is the church of Laodicea, a church that, that's part of this town, this city in Asia Minor. I'm not going to say a lot about it because you just saw it on the video. You saw everything about it. It was known for its, its wealth. It was known for its um, science, if you will, the, the medical industry that was going on there. Uh, there was so much about... Uh, this church and this town that Jesus wanted to speak to. I'm sorry, Revelation chapter 3. Revelation chapter 3, beginning in verse 14. Uh, thank you for asking that. I sometimes just assume that you knew that. But um, as, we, as we look at this tonight, it's, uh, it's, I believe God wants to speak to our cities and our communities today. And I think this message really, and we've been learning from each of these seven churches, traits and characteristics that, that speak to us, that things that we might learn from others. You know, you know, your kids can learn from the mistakes that you make, that you made in your past. Well, I know y'all didn't make any, but some other people made, right? Your kids could learn from your mistakes, or they could just be hard-headed and determine they're going to make their own mistakes. Not going to learn anything. They're just going to make them themselves. <laughs> but the wise person learns from wisdom that they've observed and they've seen and things that they've heard. The book of Proverbs says the foolish person doesn't heed, doesn't listen, and doesn't learn. So we should be wise. So the first thing we see is the audience, obviously the church, the believers that Paul probably started in Laodicea, his third missionary journey, a church that needed to hear from God. The second thing in verse 14 is the architect of this letter. Who wrote it? Could have said the author of this letter. Who, who wrote it? It's in red, isn't it? These things says the amen, the faithful and true witness. Can you turn me down just a little bit? Because the, I think being out here, it's, I'm getting, hearing a lot more of myself than I probably want to. But uh, anyway, the architect of this letter is the Lord Jesus Christ. It tells us there in the last part of verse 14, he is the amen. Who can tell me what amen means? Huh? So be it, typically, is what you'll hear as a definition. He is the so be it. There's not anybody else. He's the great amen of God of heaven. And he is the one who affirms the words of God. He, he speaks the words of God. He is the living logos. That means the word. The word logos in Greek is the word. Word. And he is the logos, the living word of God. We're reading the, the uh, written word tonight, but he is the amen. He is the final statement of God. He's also the faithful witness, the one who has stayed the course, the one who has not been artificial, the one who has not given in to sin in the world, but he has stayed to be that faithful and true witness. But one other thing, he is the beginning of the creation of God. Many times people 
kind of get this in their mind that Jesus just came about 2,000 years ago when he was born in Bethlehem. But the fact is, Jesus always was. The book of Colossians, and even we'll see it over here in chapter 4 or 5 of Revelation as we continue on in chapter 4 next week, we see that, uh, that the Jesus was there in the beginning. He, he was there. He, he, the Bible says in Colossians, He created everything. It was, everything was created by Him and for Him. And everything consists or continues because of Him. That's why I have a hard time believing that, that uh, my cows are destroying the ozone layer, as some of the politicians are saying today. That, <laughs> that, uh, that the... Uh, that the liberals would like for us to believe that man can destroy what God has created. Uh, I have doubts about much of what they're saying about the climate change. It's just a plan, a process of uh, in- income redistribution, I believe. But anyway, that's me. I just, you can believe what you want. The architect of this letter, obviously the Lord Jesus Christ, our creator God, the one who is the faithful witness, the one who knows the truth, speaks the truth, and the creator of all that is, the Lord Jesus. Number three, the accusation of this letter. Well, we begin in verse 15 with these accusations. I know your works. I know your works. You know, God knows everything we're doing here at Washtenaw. He knows everything we plan to do. He knows what our heart is about. He knows whether we're willing to squander things on that which is unimportant. He knows our heartbeat. He knows whether or not you're willing to do anything for God. He knows whether or not you're just a pew sitter or whether you just play in church or whether you really want to make a difference. If he looked at us tonight, and when I say us, I mean he looked at our hearts individually. I would like to tell you tonight that when this church does something great, it's equally divided. The the, uh, reward is equally divided amongst us all. But I'm not so sure about that because, you know, you can be sitting here and the church can do something great and yeah, if you tithe, if you gave to it financially, you would get to be a part of, you're a part of that because you help finance it. But I'm going to tell you, the person that finances it and then puts their hand on something and gets out there and goes to work is the person who God looks at their heart and they say, this person wants to make a difference. I'm going to tell you the easy thing to do is chunk a couple of dollars in the offering plate. The easy thing to do, and I say easy, it's not, tithing is not easy, but uh, what's important is that we put our hands on something. Do- Brother Ray Mears taught me that years ago when I first went to a mission trip with him to Central America. And uh, one of the things that he had learned from uh, uh, Leo Humphreys was to, to not just talk the talk, not just throw a couple dollars in, put your hands on something, do something. And I hope that we become that church that is so full of heart and hands that we want to impact this community my friend i believe that that was the accusation against laodicea even though they the people there was great wealth in that city the church had not tapped into that and had not made a difference or was not at least making the difference they could have made in that city but he says of their works that you specifically you, are neither hot or cold. I'm not saying they hadn't done anything good. I'm not saying they hadn't accomplished any good purpose for God. What I am saying to you is that for many of the people, I'm sure there were some things they had done. But for many of the people, there was a coldness of heart. There was a, there was a, 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 a lukewarmness, I should say, of heart. He said, I wish you were... Hot or cold. Why do you think he said hot or cold? I could understand him saying, I wish you were hot for God. But why would he want him to say, I wish you were cold for God? Why do you think that's important? Anybody? Be on one side or the other? Okay. Good. What else? What does it mean to be cold spiritually? Dead, uncaring. What? Separated. What? Not getting involved. But what, and why would he say, I wish some of you were just cold. If you're not going to be hot, be cold. Okay. 
All right, great. Uh, there's a guy that uh, the guy that did the Left Behind movie, Kurt uh, Kurt Cameron. His uh, guy that he works with does a lot of videos with. They go on the streets. I didn't plan on using this tonight, but I just thought about it. And uh, they go out on the streets, and here's what they do. The first thing they do is help you understand. They go through a lot of the law. They go through, have you ever taken anything that didn't belong to you? Well, most of us have to say, yeah, if it was a piece of bubble gum out of mama's purse and you didn't have permission to get it. Well, have you ever told a lie? Well, who hadn't it some way at least told a little white lie? Uh, have, you ever, have you ever been ugly to someone that you shouldn't have been? Well, yeah, pretty much all of us have done that. He said, okay, so we've made it real clear. You're an ugly, thieving, lying person. Why did he start that way? They need to realize they're lost. You know, many people you and I would go talk to in the streets uh, in, in a, that work with us and stuff like that, you know, a lot of them will say, oh, I'm okay. I'm okay. I don't, I don't need, I don't really need God. I'm doing great. I haven't done anything wrong. Some people say they had not done anything wrong. And, and what Jesus is saying here is that you've got to get some folks lost before you can get them saved. They've got to understand they're lost. And so if you're witnessing to somebody, realize sometimes your battle may be helping them see that they're lost. That way they know they're cold. There's no doubt about it. You're, hit, you're going to bust hell wide open if you don't get saved. So at least we know where we stand. But the lukewarm warm person, what does that person do? If this desk is the flaming fire of God... We're on fire for God. I mean, I'm just sitting on this desk. And cold is way over here. Man, I'm not even close to God. Here's what a lot of Christians, a lot of church members do. Well, I, I, I don't want to be lost. Mm, but I don't want to be a holy roller either. I'm going to stand here in the middle. I'm not going to get too close to God because <laughs> I liable to start showing up for outreach. I, I, I will start coming on Wednesday nights if I do that. God forbid. I don't want to become a radical, so I'm left out of the, the groups that I hang out with. So I just want to get close enough that I can just know there's a little bit of God in my life and that I'm not like those people. I'm not going to do anything. I may go to church and sit on the pew. But I just want to feel the warmth of the fire. I don't, I don't necessarily want to catch on fire. And I'm going to tell you, when I preach every week, my heart's desire is that you catch on fire. That we catch on fire. Because sometimes I'm like you. Sometimes I get caught up in the world, and I, instead of being on fire for God... I've drifted off out here, and I've been too busy, and I realize I'm not on fire anymore. And I have to remember to get on back there where I need to be. And that's what Jesus is saying here of this story to those who were lukewarm. They were just kind of wishy-washy. They didn't hate God. They just didn't love God. They, they didn't hate the church. In fact, some of them uh, were in the church. Isn't it amazing that this church may not have been First West, you know, in size I'm talking about. Probably not as big as us. Chances are maybe Laodicea wasn't as big as this group here tonight, the church. But Jesus was still looking at them. And they didn't have an excuse. You didn't have to have a lot of money. You didn't have to be in the politics to make a difference. Every person could make a difference with somebody kids you can make a difference with somebody this theme this year our SBC president I admire him for this he is uh, he's saying his our theme this year is who's your one who's your one can you touch one person in 2019 can God work through you to touch one person? Yes or no? Hello? Can he do that? What has to happen? We have to let him. Maybe even more than that, he's not going to just jump on you and make you do something you're not ready to do. 
right? So how am I going to touch somebody's life? How am I going to have one that I touched this year? It's going to be because I want that. I desire that. I desire God to work through me. God's not just going to run up and grab me and say, you're going to touch somebody whether you want to or not. I need to have a focus. I need to have a target. I want to challenge each of us to target someone this year for Jesus. Target someone to love them for Jesus. Well, you know, right now some of you are saying, well, he'll forget about that in a week or two. And I probably will. But what if we took that serious? What if we, just this group right here, took that serious? What could 2020 look like? Maybe these sections right here would just be packed. They'd just be full, and we'd be bleeding over into the other sections because there wouldn't be room for us anymore. If we all just brought one, if we all just made a difference in one person's life for Jesus, not reach 20, not reach 10, just one. I believe it would make a difference in the kingdom of God. How many of you remember the slogan of Southern Baptists in 1954? Come on, people. You ought to remember that. Huh? No, everyone reached one kind of what it was, but the theme for 1954 was a million more in 54. The theme was one million baptisms in Southern Baptist churches in 1954. Guess what? I, well, I'm, I'm not going to see it. I think they made it. I think they made it. You know how many baptisms we'll have now? And by the way, there's two to three times as many Baptists now as there was in 1954. We'll do good to baptize 300,000. Wow. But in 1954, we baptized, I don't remember if they got just over the mark, or right, but got pretty close to the million baptisms in one year. How'd that happen? Well, God was just really, God was just really uh, uh, out electing people that year. God was really on the ball electing people. No. The people got serious about reaching somebody for Christ. The people got serious about reaching one. And the whole convention was motivated to reach a million people in one year. How long ago was that? The 45, 45 years ago? 65 years ago? I was just doing a quick math in my head. A long time ago, 56 and 19, yeah. Y'all quit laughing at me. Huh? Oh, so they had prayer in school. That's what made the difference. Maybe we still loved God back in those days, right? We wasn't ashamed of Him. We do live in a different world today, don't we? We do live in a different world, but I'm here to tell you, uh, I believe our 2020 vision as a convention ought to be <laughs> something like that. Something gigantic. Something God can do. But, but anyway, that was exciting to me. The, the accusation, this church was sickening to the Lord. That's the first thing under this. It was sickening to Jesus. Wow, think about it. it I mean, that word, literally, the, 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 the video we read talked about uh, uh, spit, spit you out of my mouth, uh, some say spew you out of my mouth. Let me tell you what King James says. It says, I will vomit you out of my mouth. In other words, you make me sick. It makes me sick when you play church. It makes me sick when you just go through the motions. You know, we think God is doing a tap dance in heaven because we showed up the Sunday morning. Woo, we showed up. I'm, I, I showed up. They're going to be proud of me. Well, I ain't been here. Well, I'm committed. I come twice a month. You know, that's the new definition of committed. Two Sunday mornings a month. They are tickled. When I walk in, they're going to be tickled to death. I'm just going to kind of tip my hat to God when I walk in because He's going to be so proud of me. In fact, God looks at our heart and, and, and God says if our heart's not with Him, it sickens Him because we're playing the game to be seen of men and we're not seeking God with all of our heart. He said, if you seek me with all your heart, you'll find me. 
No fire in their bones. Luke 24, 32 said, And they said to one another, Did not our hearts burn within us when we, while we talked with us on the road, those who were on the road to Emmaus, and while he opened the scriptures to us, there was a fire in their bones when they, when they spoke with Jesus. And he opened the scriptures. And at that time, they didn't even know it was Jesus until later. There was no fear of God in their hearts. They were cold. Matthew 24, 12 says, And because lawlessness will abound, the love of many will wax cold. It talks about in the latter days. And there was no fight in their souls. They were lukewarm. They, uh, they, they didn't even know their condition. They, they probably thought they were okay. Don't you imagine? The hardest job of a preacher is sometimes to say to us, we may not be okay. Because my temptation is to say, hey, you're here today, and I'm just happy with that. Hello? I mean, that's my temptation. I, I'll be honest with you. I would love to just say, hey, I don't care if your heart's far from God. I'm just glad you showed up. And, and part of me, that's true, because, because I, I am glad you're here. And even if you're, like someone said, there's a bunch of uh, backsliders go to church. Well, sure they do. That's where they ought to be. Maybe they'll get right with God while they're here. I'm all for that. But I'm also realized the responsibility that I have to say to you, honestly say to you, are you where you need to be with God? You say, well, preacher, makes me mad when you preach like that because that's what you ought to be telling them people outside the church. My response to you is they ain't here. <laughs> You're here. Uh, and, and my job is to make sure you're being what God wants you to be. And yeah, I, wanna, I, I have a responsibility to shepherd this flock, don't I? I have a responsibility for you. If you're a sheep that's walking close to a dangerous ledge, I have a responsibility to step out there and warn you about that. And I don't always know where you are. I don't... You know, I don't always see what's just around the corner, what's over there. I don't, I don't know that. All I can do is preach truth to you and ask you to examine your own heart. So when I preach that, I'm not pointing a finger at anyone. I'm just saying, if this applies to you, hear God's word speak. If this applies to you. It may not apply to you. Sometimes people get upset because they say, well, you were talking about me. I didn't know that. That's the Holy Spirit. Right. Right. I love you enough to tell you the truth. I love you enough to warn you it, and to even say to you that sometimes you may be missing the abundant life. Listen, there's two kinds of life here. You can be saved but still be missing out on the abundant life that Christ offers you. A life of love, a life of power, a life of victory. A life that overcomes. And my challenge to you is I want to see you live the abundant life. I don't just want you to be saved. I want you to have an abundant life in Christ. I believe if there was no heaven, if there was no hell, following Jesus wholeheartedly makes life better here on earth. I believe that. Now there is a heaven and there is a hell. But I believe it'd be worth following Jesus just for the life. I look at people who don't follow Jesus. And I see their brokenness, their addictions, their pain. I'm glad. And I believe it's worth it to follow Jesus with all of your heart. Not just for the afterlife, for this life. The church is called also wretched here. The next slide, please. It's called wretched by Jesus in verse 17. This word was used to describe a person's life after it had been plundered by, by war, or a land after it had been plundered by war. It's called to, it's, it's, a, it, it's a, a land. I, I, love, I love studying the Civil War, and I love the old Civil War pictures where, you know, Abraham Lincoln or somebody's riding out through a battlefield and there's dead mules and there's dead horses and there's dead cows. No, I'm not glad the animals died. That's not what I'm saying. But I'm saying there's holes where cannons uh, blew holes in the ground. There's cannons blown up. There's dead people laying everywhere. Not happy about all that destruction. But I'm saying to me that says wretched. 
See, see what hate will do. See how man, see how far down man can go when he just destroys everything. That's kind of what the tribulation period is going to be like when the devil has a heyday on this earth. A time that is wretched. Not what God planned here on this earth. Romans 7, 24 says, O wretched man that I am, Paul said, who will deliver me from this body of death? You know, without Christ, we are wretched. We are hopeless. We are defeated and broken. The, third, the next thing about this church was pitied by Jesus. He said of them that they would be not only wretched, but miserable. There in verse 17, he says of them that they would be miserable. When I, I look at the first part of that verse and I think about what it's saying here. Yes, you're wealthy in this life. The first part of that verse, remember what he said? Because you say, I am rich and have become wealthy and have need of nothing. I think in their day and comparing that to our day, most of us, most of us can, no, no, we're, not, we're not wealthy well, I mean, some of you may be, but I mean, wealthy to me in the sense of, man, we got a home, we got a car, may have a truck, you got health, you're not starving to death. Listen, folks, if you go to bed every night and you're not when you're and you're not hungry when you go to bed, you're wealthy. Compared to forty percent of the world, you're wealthy. So we can somewhat relate to this because America, I mean the world looks at America and says, you're the rich people. You're wealthy. All of us are wealthy. And I know we're not all wealthy and there are people who are hungry in our nation, but, but the world looks at us as few, fewer problems than the world has. I mean, we're worrying about how to get a new vehicle and they're just wanting to get one that's almost broke down. It's the difference. And so he says to them, even though you appear to be have great wealth and everything, you think everything's great in your life, but you're wretched. You're miserable. He says, you're wealthy in this life, but I got news for you. You're not wealthy in the next one. You are not. When it comes to me and your bank account, your spiritual bank account with me, you're not wealthy. Let me let you know. Because the only thing we have stored up for that next life is what we've done with this life. Matthew 6, 20 says, But lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven, where neither moth nor rust does destroy, and where thieves do not break in and steal. So in the mind of God, this church really, the world may say you're wealthy, but God says you're miserable. You're broke. You're spiritually bankrupt. And this is the folks that's going to church he's talking to. We like to think that's all the bad people out there. And I'm not saying this applies to all of you. I'm not saying that. But I am saying that God says we must all be cautious. That we're not one of those that says, I don't want to be those cold people and I don't want to be these hot people. I just want to tinker around here in the middle somewhere and just feel good about myself. God says you can feel good about yourself and be spiritually bankrupt because you have no heart for God. This church had no spiritual vision. He said, last of all, they're blind. Or, or one of the next things, they were blind. <laughs> blind. They, they couldn't see what God sees. I think he used this because of the issue of the, the healing of the eye in that city, the salve that had been invented and many people's eyes had been healed in this city. And, and because of that, he, he, he was concerned about, about what they see. There was no illumination about spiritual things. There was no understanding of spiritual things. They just heard somebody say, if you do this, if you pray this prayer, you'll go to heaven magically one day. You see, I think that's the danger sometimes for the church. The danger is somewhere, somewhere along the way we get this idea, if I just say abracadabra, I believe in Jesus, we're going to heaven one day. No recognition of sin. 
no repentance of that sin. No remorse. And then no renewal. I don't know, maybe some, maybe we're saved, maybe some are saved, and, and maybe a lot of those folks are saved, but they're sure not where they need to be with God. I can't look at this scripture and figure out in this church how many were saved and how many were lost. It doesn't tell us that. That's not our job. But our job is just to say, make sure I'm not lukewarm. Your job tonight is to hear this and say, I'm not lukewarm. I'm not a mess. I'm not wretched. I'm not going to be miserable. And I'm not going to be blind. We go through a tough life. We go through a lot of hardships in this life. And if we're not careful, we'll be spiritually blind. We, we just won't, have, we won't see things the way God sees things. And therefore, we won't have the passion God has. The next one, the last one, the church could not fake their faith. They were naked. They were open to God. There wasn't anything to hide. You know, you can trick me. You can trick your Sunday school teacher. You can even trick your spouse for a while. You can trick your deacon. But you can't trick God. God sees right through your clothes, right into your heart. I believe this also reveals their trust in their own works, in their own goodness, in their own prosperity. You see, I think these folks felt like, you know, the Jews taught, if you had money, you were probably just because you were blessed of God. If you have money, you were just been smiled on by God. And that's when, when Jesus said, you know, it's harder for a rich man to get through heaven than it is for a poor man. I mean, he said, he said it is, I mean, it'd be easier for that camel to get through the eye of that little needle than it would be whether we're talking about a little gate or whether we're talking about a real needle. It'd be easier for that to happen than it would be for a rich man to get into heaven. And they're all sitting around here saying, I'm rich. And Jesus made, God made me rich. That's how I'm rich. God made me rich. They probably taught the prosperity gospel right there in that church. And when Jesus said, no, 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 you folks, I know Jews, the Jewish theologians have taught you that if you're wealthy, God has smiled on you. You're okay with God. And Jesus said, I got news for you guys. If you're wealthy, you need to be real careful. Because you could have gold as your God. And greed may be your glory. And if that's the case, you're going to have trouble making it into heaven. And that just blew the Jews' mind. In fact, they asked questions, what, what do you mean? I mean, we've never heard that before. And here this is what's being said to the church at Laodicea. Don't rest on your wealth and think you're going to have enough prosperity to get your way into heaven. There's not enough money to buy what you can't afford to buy. And that's salvation of God. Last of all, the appeal of this letter, verses 18 to 20. The appeal of this letter, they needed to buy some of heaven's gold. I literally had this. We're coming in one at a time, but I didn't. I may not have showed you guys that. I, my bad. But, and that, this is easier, doing it this way. Thank y'all. The appeal of this letter, God said, you want to buy something, you can't buy salvation, but you better think about something worth investing in. Counsel to buy from me gold refined in the fire. What do you think he meant by that? I want to give you some gold that's refined by the fire. In other words, he's saying to them, I want you to invest in eternity. I want you to invest in the next life. I want you to invest, when he says refined by fire, that's a picture of when they would, when a, gold, a silversmith or a goldsmith in those days would take and they would heat up gold or silver and they would heat it up till it boiled and, and all the impurities come to the top and they scrape it off and they throw it on the ground. They get all the impurities out of it and eventually it'll be like a mirror. You can look into it and see your face. And what Jesus is saying to them, I want some of you to get the heat turned up in your life. Because when the heat, the spiritual heat turns up in your life, you'll start thinking about me. And you'll start thinking about eternity. And you'll stop just thinking about yourself. 
He says, I want some of you to go out there and be martyrs for me. I, by that, I mean that's what Acts 1.8 says, go out and be my martyrs or my witnesses. He's saying, I want some of you to live so much in love with me that the world sometimes hates you. Does, can I ask, does anybody hate your spirituality? Does, does anybody hate your faith? I mean, I know it's America and everybody's Christian. If you're not, you ought to be, right? It's America. But I'm here to tell you there's some lost folks out there that it ought to rub them raw because your faith is so real and they don't have it. I read, constantly read articles about this, people who are mad. Uh, you know, I told you last week, the, the, the Congress, one of the houses of Congress, they're trying to take, so help me God, out of the pledge that somebody takes that comes to be a witness. They don't want them to, they don't want anybody to take a pledge to God. Why? Because that just makes them mad. These people that live by their faith, just makes them mad. They want to get off work and go to the bar and get drunk until time to go to bed that night. And they don't want to think about consequences of the life that they live. And God is saying to them here, I want you to, I want you to have a, I want you to invest in eternity. First Peter 1 7, that the genuineness, I'm sorry, the genuineness of your faith being much more precious than gold that perishes, though it is tested by fire, may be found to praise, honor, and glory at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Gold refined by fire, the judgment seat of Christ. It says in Zechariah 13, 9, it says, I'll bring one-third through the fire. I will refine them as silver is refined, and test them as gold is tested, and they will call on my name. Zechariah 13 is talking about the last days. And I'll answer them, and I'll say, this is my people. And each one of them will say, the Lord is my God. How's he going to determine who's God's people? He's going to run them through the fire. He's going to allow them. Jesus said, if you love me, you'll be hated. They hated me. Some of them going to hate you. It doesn't mean we have to be ugly. You know what I found out? You don't have to be ugly to be hated. You just have to stand for truth. They needed white garments. And second thing, they needed white garments. Laodicea was famous for making black wool. And he was saying that that's what their righteousness looks like. That black wool, you can imagine, you know, I got some black cows. I wonder if I could sell their fur. Get some black wool. It was famous in that day. They got a lot of money out of that. But he's saying here the white garments really represents their righteousness. I want you to, I want you to quit worrying about the black wool. I want you to spend a little more time looking for some white righteous robes that you wear. And they needed to get their eyes, their vision checked. God says blindness represents a lack of understanding of spiritual truth. Laodicea's famous school of medicine and special ointment called Phrygian powder, famous for its cure of eye defects. Here's why that's important. Acts 26, 18 says this. To open their eyes in order to turn them from darkness to light. And from the power of Satan to God, that they may receive forgiveness of sins and an inheritance among those who are sanctified by faith in me. One of the things that stands out to me, and I know our time is up and I need to conclude. One of the things that stands out to me about this, and you could say it for today. I think of God up in heaven and Paul's out there taking his missionary journeys, being tried by fire. And Paul's taking these missionary journeys and he goes through, through Laodicea and he, he has a Bible study with a group of believers and, and out of that Bible study comes a group, comes a church, the founding of a church and, and in a town of great wealth, they're kind of probably much like in Africa, they maybe got some poles or some rocks and they, they just made them a little hut that they could get under and start having church. And as time grew on, worldliness and wealth crept into the church and maybe some rich people got saved and came into the church or at least wanted to be a part of these folks that get to go to heaven. And I could see God up in heaven 
looking around at St. Peter and saying, Hey, Pete, you know down there? We got a church in Laodicea. We making things happen. I got one over there in, uh, in oh, Ephesus. Oh, and every little community through there has got a church in it. And God could just step back and say, Whoo, there's a sign out front that says First Baptist Church, Ephesus. First Baptist Church, Laodicea. And God could just step back and say, You know, I don't care about them. I don't care what how bad they are. I don't care how cold their heart is. I don't care if they're just playing church. I'm just glad they got that First Baptist Church sign out there. But instead, God looks at His people because His church represents something. And God expects us to represent something, to be something on this corner. God gave us This piece of property. He gave us this facility. He gave us a couple signs outside. And I'm here to tell you, He wants us to do something with it. Amen? God's not just pleased that we got a sign outside. He wants us to do something with it. That's what I see in this church of Laodicea. God just saying, it's great that Paul started a church there. But we've got to be more than just have a sign out front. We got to do something. And that's what God was after. God's saying, Come on, guys. Take your head out of the sound, sand. Let, let me give you a vision of heaven and a vision of hell. And let me give you a vision of King Jesus. And get excited about him. They were about to face God's judgment, number 19, verse 19. As many as, as many as I love, I rebuke and chasten. Therefore, be zealous and repent. You know, if God loves you, He says He's not afraid to punish you. Just like you do your children. They were about to face judgment because of the coldness of their heart. The, the passivity, the, the, uh, the lukewarmness of their faith. They were offered to find God's grace. If they would repent, he says there. Oh, God's still offering grace, isn't he? He's still giving them a chance to repent and get right with God. They could hear. They could respond in verse 20. Behold, I'm standing at the door knocking. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I'll come into him. Dine with him and he with me. Many times we've taken that verse, just to be honest, Revelation 3.20, how many plans of salvation? Do you see that's the last verse in the plan of salvation? And God is standing there, pictures of God standing at the door of your heart, knocking, and God wants to come in and save you. And that's spiritually true. But to be theologically correct, and in context here, Jesus is actually standing at the door of this church and saying, I'm trying to get into your church. Let me in. Let me in. Because if I get in there, I'm going to do something. If I get in there, we're going to have vision. And we're going to have power. Someone said there was a big fire in a church down the street. And they all ran down there. And as the church was going up in fire, and they were spraying... They were spraying... uh, water on the fire and one of the people standing there beside another guy he said you know I tried to go to that church years ago and they told me I wasn't welcome he says been years I thought about maybe trying to get back in there and see if they'd let me come in now but anytime I've seen them in town they just hadn't made me feel very welcome in that church the other guy looked over at him he said man don't sweat it Ain't no big deal. He said, God been trying to get in that church for years. Sometimes we better make sure we're making room for God. You know, when you sing, when you worship, when you teach, when you sit there in your pew on Sunday morning, everything we do, everything this choir does, everything you do, the, 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 the countenance on your face, it's all pointed toward one audience, God. It's not to impress me. It's not to impress each other. 
There's one audience here. You're not the audience. You're not the audience. God is the audience. And everything we do, the look on our face, the songs that we sing, the way you act in Sunday school class, it is God who is watching and deserves to be worshipped. Deserves to be treated like he's alive and worthy of praise. That's what chapter 4 is about. Oh man, think about that when you come to church. You're not trying to impress the preacher. I'm not the audience. I, 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 when I preach, I have an audience of one. I don't preach to impress you. I preach to please God. And that's who you have to please. Not me. God. So I pray that you do that. They give you the opportunity. We'll be given the opportunity to reign with Jesus on this earth. Uh, Move on to the next slide, please. We're going to get an opportunity to reign with Him. I... If you go to Matthew 19, 28, 29, Jesus said to them, And surely I say to you that in the regeneration, when the Son of Man sits on the throne of His glory, you who have followed Me will also sit on twelve thrones, judging the twelve tribes of Israel. And everyone who has left houses and brothers or sisters or father or mother or wife or children or lands for My name's sake, he shall receive a hundredfold and inherit eternal life. Revelation 20, verse 4 And I saw thrones, and they sat on them, and judgment was committed to them. There's not but one God, and that's plural. Then I saw the souls of those who had been beheaded for their witness to Jesus and for the word of God, who had not worshipped the beast or his image and had not received his mark on their foreheads or on their hands. And listen now, and they lived and reigned with Christ for a thousand years. Do you know what our future holds? We're going to reign with Jesus, folks, if you're real. You say, well, I don't feel worthy. It's not about being worthy. And your job and my job may be a little bitty thing. We may just have ten feet, we, we, ten by ten square we're ruling and reigning over. But we're going to help God. We're going to reign with Jesus during that thousand-year millennial kingdom. When we come back, there will be a battle of Armageddon, the judgment of the the sheep and the goats, and the judgment of the nations, and we're going to move into the thousand-year millennial kingdom, and we're going to serve with Him during that time. (coughs) Daniel 7, 27 says, The kingdom and dominion and the greatness of the kingdoms under the whole heaven shall be given to the people and the saints of the Most High, His kingdom, is an everlasting kingdom, and all dominion shall serve and obey Him. Even the book of Daniel talks about that day. 1 Corinthians 6, 2 says, Do you not know that that the saints will judge the world? And if the world will be judged by you, are you unworthy to judge the smallest matters? And he's talking about us judging right and wrong. 2 Timothy 2, 12 If we endure, we shall also reign with Him. But if we deny Him, He's going to deny us. You and I, that last verse, 2 Timothy 2.12. The right to sit on Christ's throne with Him. Not on His throne, but on other thrones. One of the many promises made to overcomers in these seven churches. I want to list some of them to you. In 2, 7, chapter 2, verse 7, we talked about the blessing for overcomers to be, to be able to eat of the tree of life. In 2, 10, we would be given the crown of life. In 2, 11, check the next slide, see if those are listed on there. Uh, go on. I've done that one. Go on to the next one. One more. There they are. There's the blessings promised to the overcomers. The tree of life, the crown of life, no second death, hidden manna, which God will provide, a white stone with a new name of your new who you are, God's family, 
In the last part there of chapter 2 and then chapter 3 and verse 21, we'll reign with Jesus. That's what I was just reading to you about. Next slide. In 228, we'll get to, get to see and be a part of the morning star. In 3.5, we'll have white garments, picture of righteousness. 3.5 also, we'll have the honor of being confessed by Jesus before His Father. In 3.12, we'll be made a pillar in God's temple. In 3.12 also, we'll have God's name on us. Those are pretty good things. Pretty good reason for overcoming, isn't it? In closing, listen to this poem, prayer of a half-hearted Christian, a lukewarm Christian. I love my church, O God. Her walls before me stand. But please excuse my absence, Lord. This bed is simply grand. And charge to keep I have, a charge to keep I have, a glory to God, a God to bring glory. But Lord, don't ask for cash from me. The glory comes too high. Am I a soldier of the cross, a follower of the Lamb? Yes, though I seldom pray or pay, I still insist that I am. Must Jesus bear the cross alone and all the world go free? No, others, Lord, should do their part. But please, don't count on me. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise Him, all creatures here below. O oh, loud my hymns of praise I bring, because it doesn't cost to sing half hearted lukewarm prayer what price are we willing to pay to not be a Laodicea but to live for Jesus let's stand and we'll be dismissed tonight I want to say to you, I would much rather stand up here and say, we're all okay, you're okay, I'm okay, you showed up, everything will be great. Used to, I, I heard somebody tell me, they said, preacher, we, used, we was always told if we showed up for church and paid our tithes, man, we couldn't do no better than that. But the fact is, that's just part of it, isn't it? There's more from our heart. Let's close in prayer tonight. If you'd like to talk to me about salvation or about any other issue, please see me when the service Concludes. Father, thank you for tonight. Thank you, God, as we've looked at these seven churches to observe their mistakes and their hearts. And God, I pray that we have at least learned that we don't want to be like that. God, you've called us to go that extra mile to be that believer, God, that you would have us to be. Teach us, Lord, your ways is my prayer. God, I want this, I pray that this church on this corner will truly illuminate this community for your glory and for your honor. Help us, Lord, to grow in Christ this year. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Next week, next Sunday night, I'm going to be out of town. But the Sunday night after that, I have to be in Nashville next Sunday night. But the Sunday night after that, I'm going to start on chapter 4, verse 1. Okay? Thank you all.